Hello, get your sacks together, people. My name is Jamie Anderson, pro saxophonist Jamie Anderson, and you're watching a Get Your Sacks Together live stream. And this episode is the Sax Factor. <laughs> have you got the Sax Factor? You guys have been submitting all your videos to me. <laughs> I'm going to be playing some of your submissions and offering some constructive criticism, some tips, some advice some compliments. Don't worry, it's not going to be all nasty. Uh, if your video hasn't come up, then don't worry because I've had loads more videos than I can possibly get through. So if it's a popular format and maybe you can let me know in the comments, then maybe I'll do another one and your video will come up. I did have quite a few videos coming quite early, so don't worry if your video isn't featured this week and apologies if it hasn't come up. <laughs> okay, I've had a few problems, tech problems with the live shows recently, so keeping everything crossed that you guys can hear me okay. So if you can hear me okay, give me a shout in the chat. I can see there's loads of people already in the chat. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. Uh, I can see uh, Toronto, Scotland, Kilmarnock, Oslo. Um, who else we got? Australia, uh, Norway, uh, Devon in the UK, Sweden, South of England. I'm just quickly skimming through. Thank you all so much for joining me. Let me know if you can hear me loud and clear and we'll uh, get straight on with the show. But just before we do that, if you want to get a really great practice routine under your belt, you're losing focus with your practice, you don't know what to do each day, or if you want some great technical exercises, or some other tips for improvising and making your solo sound better without learning new skills and chords, go and, if you haven't already, go and check out my free one hour saxophone success masterclass. Okay, everyone's saying the sound is good. Good news, thank you very much people for that feedback. Yeah, free saxophone success masterclass. It's a one hour solid chunk of teaching straight from the pro stage. You're gonna love it. There's so many aha moments in there. So hope you enjoy that guys. Now then, let's get on with the show, shall we? So without further ado, I'm gonna get the first clip up. <laughs> now the first clip is an interesting one because I think we've got a bit of a joker on our hands. But here we go, here are the videos coming right up. Okie dokes, now the first video is, <laughs> the first video is by a gentleman called Peter Barlow. And I would like you to comment in the chat if you think this is him actually playing or not, because Peter, I think, it's a bit of a prank, isn't it? Because I don't think you're actually playing this. Fingers not quite coordinated with the music. Breathing not quite coordinated. Sound doesn't sound like it's coming quite from his saxophone. What do you think? Yep, jury's out on that one. I did actually ask Peter to submit a video of him playing it on his own, and he did not. He did not, people. I think somebody is trying to wind us up. Okay, let's move on to the second video, which is now actually real people who are taking the challenge seriously. Fake, everyone says fake. Oh, Bruce thinks it's real so far, yeah. When you listen to it closely, the sound sounds like it's coming from a stereo and his fingers aren't quite coordinated. Fake it till you make it. <laughs> That's a good comment from Charles. Thanks for that. Right, now the people who actually were serious about it. Now, I would like to start by saying thank you so much for submitting your videos. I know this is a very vulnerable thing to do. I think you're all extremely brave. I've got nothing but respect for you for putting yourself right in the limelight. And I will go easy on you, don't worry. So thank you so much, and I respect you so much for doing it. Let's see what we got then. Uh, I haven't got all the blurb that people wrote with it, unfortunately, but we're going to start with Lorenzo Ronconi. Now, all these videos are uh, being played in the order in which they were submitted to me. I know many of you submitted it, and I can't get to all of them, but you should have got in there quicker. Okay, here is Lorenzo Ronconi. <laughs> Okay. 
<laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much, Lorenzo. Love that. Lots of positive stuff in this video. Like your sound. I like your articulation. You've got nice, crisp articulation going on there. I like your timing. And this is one of the hardest things to do is to play on your own without any backing. You're playing with a lot of soul. You're playing with um, a lot of feeling. And I really love that. The tips that I might have for you at this point is just to dig into that groove a little bit more, get your sound that little bit bigger, a bit more attack and just a bit more groove and funk as you play these little riffs. So da, 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 let me see if I can um, quickly find the key of what you're doing and, and uh, show you what I mean. So re really, Lorenzo, it's those little ghosted notes in between and a massive attack on the front of the note, which is going to make all the difference to give you that extra level of funk. Your timing is actually really good already. So a bit more punch on the notes, a bit more attack and just, you know, a bit more dynamic here and there. Some notes quiet, some notes loud, but... Thank you so much. That was a wonderful submission. I'm going to see if my um, applause button is working. Fantastic stuff. Let's now move on to David Garcia, who is playing um, uh, a sax solo from a Serge uh, Gainsborough track. Here we go. <laughs> Great. Nice one. Thank you so much for that. That was absolutely brilliant stuff. Now, one of the best things you can possibly do for your playing is to do transcriptions of your favorite solos. So um, David has done exactly the right thing here. He's taken a solo he loves, he's transcribed it, and he's playing along with the original, which is a super valuable thing to bring your playing on. Sound-wise, could be a little bit stronger, a little bit Put a bit more air through it, support that sound a bit more. And what else can I say that would maybe take this from really good to the next level? There is, now this might be a bit of a recurring theme in these videos, but there is a bit of the lip scoops in there. Now you might remember one of my uh, two videos ago, I talked about lip scoops, the dreaded lip scoops. It's not that dreaded, don't worry about it, but you are doing a little bit of lip scoops. So instead of scooping up the notes with your lip, which can sound a little bit dicey at times, try and use your larynx and a combination of your larynx and grace notes to scoop into notes. But fantastic submission. Thank you very much, David. Well, of course, David, yes, fantastic. Thank you all in the chat. I see there's some really supportive comments in the chat. And yeah, let's put this to the jury as well. Let's see what you guys think. Let's see if the saxophonists who have entered their videos have got the sax factor. <laughs> right, let's move on to number three. Who's up next? The third video to be submitted. Well, actually, it's the fourth one. We won't count the first one. But the fourth one is Scott Lewin. Now, I think he's got two very short videos. So let's have a little listen to Scott. Here's his first one. <laughs> Short and sweet, love that. And his other one was this. Here we go, Scott Lewin, part two. Right, little snippet of a standard there. So a little bit tricky to judge Scott on this one because there's so little to work with, but um, the first thing I'd mention is probably articulation. The notes tend to be a little bit surging 
surging, the, the start of the note is a little bit like a instead of a ta. So just by using a little bit more articulation, a bit more tonguing, you might have a, a cleaner start to your notes. What key are you? So just clean tonguing at the start of the notes will demarcate the rhythm much more clearly and I could hear it a bit more clearly on the first clip as well but uh, a little bit of work to do to strengthen your tone and to make it a lot more kind of broad and thick and chunky but let's bear in mind I don't have written down how long some people have been playing like often people have only been playing days weeks months so it's all about it's all about where you're going to go from here, not a criticism of where you are right now. So great submission. Thanks very much. Great choice of tune there as well. Let's give, let's give, let's give it up for Scott. <laughs> okay, and I can see that some people are actually here live to witness their videos. I saw David up there. Right, let's move on, shall we? See who's got the sax factor next. Who's next in the little list? Right, number five. Terenti Sunny. Let's see what this sounds like. Okay, that was great. By the way, it was Terenti and the, the song was Sunny, obviously. <laughs> I just uh, misread my notes there. Obviously, the song was Sunny. Yeah. And my son is called Sunny, so this song's got a very special place in my heart. I loved that passion. Who loved the energy and the passion of that one? Put it in the chat if you're like feeling just the, the full-on commitment and vibes there. That was absolutely awesome, Terenti. That's wonderful stuff. In terms of, um, you know, picking it up to the next level, I love your improvisation. You're obviously like really familiar with that uh, pentatonic scale, which on alto is a G minor pentatonic. Maybe just think about easing back on the really like fast, florid runs so much and focus on playing a slightly more simple in the pocket phrase, just instead of, you know, the sheets of sound type scenario. Let me see if I can demonstrate. First, I'll kind of, I'll demonstrate the sort of runs that you're playing and then I'll demonstrate the sort of runs that you might think about without taking away too much of your own style, which I love. But um, just now and again, play something a little bit more thematic and in the pocket. So here we go. So hopefully you can see there that I'm trying to maintain the energy of the performance that you did, but just bring it in, bring those phrases a little more relatable, a little more in the pocket, but what a fantastic and passionate performance of a wonderful song. I love that song. So give it up for Terenti. Wonderful. I love that one. Let's move on. Is everyone having fun? Is this like a fun... Uh, is this a, I'm having a lot of fun. I hope everyone else is enjoying this. 
It's one of the most valuable things, just before I move on to the next video, um, it's actually one of the most valuable things. Let me just flick back to here for a sec. One of the most valuable things you can get is direct feedback on your own performance because a million YouTube videos you can watch, you can take you know, a million online courses, but that one little tip from someone who can listen you know, dispassionately to your performance can be real gold. And you can also benefit by listening to other people, which is why this whole kind of uh, series is gonna be really cool for you guys. You can listen to other people's performances and see what I say about them and how it relates to you. Right, let's now move on to the next one. And it is uh, Daniela Fusco, who's playing Punga by Klingandi. Let's check it out. All right, that was awesome. Love that. I don't uh, don't know the original. If I do know the original, I'm not certainly not very familiar with it. But loads of great stuff going on there. Great groove. I could really feel the rhythm. You know, doo -doo -doo, right behind everything you played, which is wonderful to hear. Really nice articulation. Crispy, very sharp. Nice bump to the beginning of it. Every note. I love that. You get up there into the altissimos there. Uh, not the strongest notes in your range, up in that altissimo range, but you're still doing the business. Um, if I was to have just, you know, to raise you to the next level, very slight lip scoops going on instead of throat bending. So this might be a bit of a recurring theme, but try and when you're bending up to notes, instead of using your lip to scoop up, try and do a combination of uh, grace notes and your larynx like I said from two videos ago what I didn't do two videos ago is, is actually demonstrate lip scoops uh, but I can't redo really lip scoops I'll have a go and then I'll demonstrate how to do it properly so Yeah, I'm not the greatest at doing lip scoops, so it's a bit difficult to contrast it with me, but that is really my only criticism. Watch out for the lip bends. They sound a little bit out of control, but fantastic job. Well done. <laughs> I'll just put this up in the, uh, is this add to broadcast, right, yeah. This is uh, Paul Bonnet is saying, great session, but I'm scared now as I made his submission. Love it. Don't be scared, it'll be all right, okay. Let's move on, shall we? And the next video we have on offer is by Charlie Lewis, and he's playing Me and My Shadow. Here we go.
All right, all right, all right. Thanks very much for that submission. Charlie, that was absolutely wonderful. I love the feeling of it. I love the melody. I love the way you, you expressed the melody. I can't see anything about your embouchure because of that absolutely phenomenal beard. And I love the double angle. <laughs> I love the double angle video thing. Um, yeah, played with a lot of feeling and I really love the enthusiasm that you play with. Really nice articulation. There were some nice short notes in there with nice crispy articulation. I love that. In terms of, you know, raising your game from here onwards, obviously your sound needs a little bit more strengthening. And one thing um, which I would comment on is your vibrato, which feels a little bit sort of quavery and unsure. Your vibrato, a little bit habitual, not quite sure, you know, not very confident on the vibrato. So I think I've got a video coming out very soon. It might even be on Sunday all about vibrato. So keep your eyes peeled for that one. I'll just demonstrate what I mean. And if you watch next week's video on vibrato, I'll have the answer to this problem. So I'll try and play your vibrato and then I'll try and demonstrate the kind of fluid connected vibrato, which is really gonna boost the intensity of your sound rather than diminishing the intensity of your sound. Here we go. Um, hopefully you might have been able to tell the difference between the two there. One's just that so slightly shaky, unsure, um, almost like you're very nervous. You might well be very nervous. <laughs> Let's not forget that. And um, the vibrato which I'll teach you on the next video is a very connected and intense. It adds intensity instead of taking away intensity to your sound. So thanks very much for that awesome submission. <laughs> Okie dokes, who have we got next? We have got Gordon Bowie. Might be Bowie, might be Bowie. And he's doing an Ibiza sax mashup. Let's have a little listen to this. Let's have a listen to Gordon. Very pro in the titles. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Gordon. You've obviously got a hell of a lot together there. Awesome. Pro job, titles, nice loud sound. Love it. That was, of course, Jubel, which I'm sure many of you many of you know if you're into your dance sax stuff. In fact, you can learn how to play it on this very channel. So a couple of little points for you, Gordon. So um, great job, great groove, great sound, great enthusiasm, great feeling. So much good stuff going on there that's overwhelmingly good. And you're obviously somebody who plays out live and probably does a great job with it. So congratulations on that. I would say, first of all, have a look at your posture. So you're a little bit collapsed in your posture and you've got quite a, you know, your head has got that sort of forward carriage. Whereas if you just, if you just kind of straighten up yourself, kept your head in a more neutral position instead of this kind of reaching for the sax thing. I just want to, I just want to reach into the video and like pull your sling up a little bit, to be honest. <laughs> um, 
because you might be, the, the, I keep trying to touch the screen, but um, you might be kind of changing the angle of your windpipe, putting a bit of strain on your neck. So that's my first point, which is a posture thing. And actually in uh, three or four videos, I've got a whole thing on posture. So that's another uh, great resource coming up in the, about a month or two. So posture one thing, uh, in terms of the actual tune that you're playing, it might well be that you've just decided to interpret it your own way. The, I'm specifically talking about the rhythm of the first phrase. Just gonna back it up a little bit here. Right, so on the original, the first phrase goes three, four, one. One. And you're going three, four. So you're kind of putting it on the beat. That might just be an artistic interpretation. If it is, totally cool, man. But if you're trying to play it like the original song that most people know, you've got the rhythm a little bit wrong at the start there, but no biggie. Apart from that, great job. Really enjoyed that. And, you know, there's a lot more where that came from, obviously, on that video, but unfortunately, we haven't got time to watch it also. Great job, Gordon. Love that. Love that. Who's next? Is anyone quaking in their boots? <laughs> Waiting for their video to come up. <laughs> All right, that was number eight, so let's go to number nine. This is Paul Bonnet, who I happen to... Oh, Paul's in the chat, isn't he? I think I've seen him. This is him playing Largo. And it says in my little notes here to start at 22 seconds. So here we go, Paul. Hi, it's Paul Bonnet. He does a nice little introduction, says hello to everyone. Well done for that. And so here we go. <laughs> Great job, thanks very much for that. That's absolutely wonderful. Everyone is so brave for submitting their videos. You're all heroes. You've all got the sax factor in my book. Now, it doesn't sound to me, um, first of all, thanks very much. I love the way you shape the melody. A lot of good stuff going on there. Um, it doesn't sound like you're tonguing. It doesn't sound like you're tonguing much. I would go as far as to say, it doesn't sound like you're tonguing at all correct me if i'm wrong so just in case i don't want to teach you you know anyone's grandmother how to suck eggs but when you start each note paul your tongue should be muting let me go full screen for a sec so i can show you properly when you start each note your tongue should be mute should be um just underneath or you know near the tip of the reed and it's on the reed so the reed can't vibrate then you blow and so you've got breath pressure behind the mouthpiece and at the instant you blow you take your tongue away and it goes da so you get a nice clean start to the note that's what tonguing is instead of just going ha and starting to blow to get the reed going from naught to 60 so to speak so you put your tongue on the reed and as you blow take it off and that will give you a ta it'll give you that nice that's what i was talking about earlier that nice crisp little bit of noise at the start of the note, which demarcates where the beginning of the note is. Cha. Now, obviously you're not gonna tongue every note. That depends on the, the phrases. Sometimes you wanna join notes up smoothly, but certainly the first note you play of any phrase will be tongued. Another word for that is articulation. So that's something to look at. And I've got at least two videos about that. If you look in my technique playlist on the channel, but wonderful playing. Thank you very much for that. Let's have a round of applause. Oops, I'm on the wrong screen for the round of applause. Hey, nice one, Paul, well done. All right, now look, he says in the chat, when our tongue seemed to make duck noises, only playing for six weeks. Wow, that's brilliant, only playing for six weeks. Unbelievable, well done. Um, okay, can't get too interactive between me and the chat because there's too much of a delay, but Maybe just try and tongue a bit more likely and um, you can go and check out my two videos on the channel about articulation. Right, let's now move on. That was 
Paul. Okay, Rob Stevens. Have we got Rob Stevens in the house? Normally Rob's on these things. And this tune is called My All. Here we go, Rob. <laughs> How nice was that? That was absolutely awesome. That was so good. I love that, Rob. Love the like the breathy sound, the kind of subtone vibes going on. I love the the kind of old school vibrato you're throwing in there. Um, so much good stuff. It's played with a lot of feeling. You obviously really enjoy your playing. I love that. Um, incidentally, oh, Rob's here. Yeah, great. Thanks for joining us live. Um, you have got a whole community of sax players right there in the chat to give you some feedback. And if anyone's got any feedback or comments or tips to help our Get Your Sax Together community here live, please do chip in. It's all valuable stuff. Uh, now, in terms of taking it to the next level, Rob, one thing is you've got that kind of head down posture, uh, which is kind of the opposite of Gordon, who we saw you know, just a minute ago. Gordon had his head carriage forward. Your head carriage is kind of back, which again is doing the same thing, which is changing the natural position of your windpipe and your neck. So maybe you could just try and get a more neutral head position. So it seems to work for you okay. I mean, you look at Lester Young, for God's sake. So there's no like one rule fits all, but that's one comment. In terms of the music, I think you could look at extending some of the notes and just arcing them a bit longer, taking slightly longer phrases with each breath. We tend to get dabs of pain, does dead phrase, phrase, phrase. But it's such a lovely melody. I think you could start, you know, from one point, arc the melody a bit longer, take a longer breath and expand into the next phrase and really take us with you on that journey. So that's my only tip I'd have, but it was a wonderful rendition and it was really quite touching and played with a lot of feeling. So thanks a lot, Rob. Woo, 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 woo. Loving that, it's going well. Okay, next we have is Steve Belgrade in the house. He's playing Still Got the Blues. Here we go, Steve. <laughs> Well played indeed, that was great. <laughs> played with a lot of passion that one, Steve, well done. Um, loads of good stuff going on, you've got like, you're blowing plenty of air through the instrument, you're getting a nice strong sound out your alto. Good recording there with the SM58, playing along with the backing track, love that. And I like the way you're playing with a lot of emotion because all the technical stuff in the world can't make up for playing with that feeling and that emotion, so I love that, that was great. <laughs> um, in terms of, you know, my little tips, Little tipperoos. 
I would say that you are very much in the lip scoop camp. Again, let's not judge the lip scoops, but you are a lip scooper. So if you look at my last video, you might want to look at, as I've already said, using your larynx or, or grace notes to bend into them rather than the habitual into the notes. That's one tip. Uh, the next tip is just to try and be a little bit more careful where your rhythms are. I like the I like the way that the the melody is quite you know free and you're interpreting it in a way where you're scattering the notes around. But sometimes you can just play the notes a bit more on the grid, and the way that you interpret the melody will just have that little bit more focus rather than kind of like all over the place all the time. Sometimes it, it pays just to be right in the pocket the way you play the melody, okay? So, wonderful performance. Thanks very much, Steve. We're loving that. Loving that, loving that. Okay, everybody enjoying themselves down there in the chat. I can see there's lots going on. <laughs> I should be taking a drink when I'm playing the next video. Okay, next we have... Um, Somebody who I have taught, Tim Wilsden, and he's playing your latest trick, the um, Mike Brecker line from the famous Dar Straits tune, which I love, but it's in a tricky key. And I don't think Tim's been playing very long, so let's hear this. <laughs> Yes, nice job, Tim. Loving that. That must have taken you a long time to learn. I love that. Just before we talk about Tim, I'm going to respond to something in the comments that Phil has said, one of my keen viewers, Phil Asante. And he says, um, we'll come right on to Tim in a minute, don't worry. Um, and he says, if I can put it up on the um, broadcast, I hear what you're saying about lip scoops and using throat or grace notes, but what is wrong with, losing, with um, using lip scoops if they sound good? That is a great question, Phil, and it's very much a matter of opinion if you think they sound good or not. My opinion is that lip, lip scoops don't sound good on sax. Other people's opinion is that it might sound okay. Now, there are no lip scoops in sax that I've heard to speak of before the 1970s. So why is it that every classic saxophonist that learned the instrument up to the 1970s didn't do lip scoops? And then from the 70s and then especially into the 80s, you've got this load of lip scoops coming through. And it's probably because most of the people who we're talking about here weren't um, sort of academically or systematically trained in saxophone. The guys that were doing those pop and rock gigs from the 70s and 80s just kind of learned themselves. Now, when you're not taught properly, that's the kind of thing you do. Now, in my opinion, it doesn't sound that great. But you know what they say about opinions? <laughs> well... I have got a phrase about opinions, but it's probably not appropriate for this broadcast, so I'll keep it to myself. Anyway, great point. Thanks for making that, Phil. Um, and let's move on now back to Tim's uh, video. Oh, is it going to start playing again? Um, okay. Okay. Right. Fantastic job, Tim. You got all the notes in the right place. It's really hard to get those fingerings. It's not an easy key. Um, so fantastic job. In terms of little, you know, upgrades, I would say probably in general, you're playing a bit flat overall. It's hard to get sax in tune on every note, but you're probably a bit flat overall. So I would tend to push on a bit and um, just try and work on getting the notes that little bit more in time. That's the next step. But that's all I'd say. Push in a bit. Keep working at it. You've done a great job there. So... I'll give you a little. I'll give you a little demo. I'll play it on tenor, if I can remember it. I haven't got. The, I haven't played this for a while. 
the more you can get it right in the groove, the more convincing it'll sound. No matter what your sax tone's like, your rhythm will make you sound really convincing. So let me have a little go at playing this. Maybe first of all, I'll try and play it, you know, a little bit out of time, and then I'll try and play it bang in time, and hopefully you'll be able to tell the difference sort of before and after. <laughs> Um, yeah, getting a bit carried away there. I love it so much. So the second, the, the way I played it the second time, you can see the notes are really, you know, more like a drummer, and it just makes it all sound a little bit more convincing. But wonderful job. Fantastic learning that really hard song. So keep practicing, keep at it, and respect goes to you. <laughs> Round of applause for Tim. That was pretty awesome. Right, let's see who's next. That was number 12. So now we have got Bill Dale. Bill, are you there? Bill, in the chat. If you are, put your hand up. Incidentally, we will be having the usual Q&A at the end. So, you know, start thinking about your questions. I'll probably do a few more videos. Then we're into the Q&A. So here's Bill Dale, and he is improvising on Rhythm Changes, which is the chord sequence for I Got Rhythm. Here we go. Oh yeah, Bill, that was awesome. Loved it. Now, so much good stuff going on here with your playing as well, Bill. First of all, how good is it to hear soprano, guys? I mean, come on, big up if anyone thinks it's refreshing to hear a bit of soprano for a change, I love it. I, didn't, I don't even have my soprano out, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I love soprano as well. Now, you are really confidently hitting a lot of great notes in those changes. The chords come thick and fast on rhythm changes. And I noticed that you're really hitting some of the important guide tones, which is lovely to see. You obviously really know what's going on with the chords. The things that I would use, oh, in terms of the chords, for example, I know that um, we're talking B flat pitch now, it's uh, rhythm changes in C. When you get to bar five, you've got the F chord, then the F minor chord, you're playing it A, you're playing an A flat, that lovely guide tone line. So total respect for that, that's absolutely brilliant. In terms of raising the level of what you do. You've got some really nice melodic phrases, which I really enjoyed. It kind of boils back to rhythm. You know, if it, don't mean anything if it ain't got that swing. Let, let me put it that way. It's really hard when you're improvising to think of everything at once, isn't it? I know that people feel frozen in the headlights when they come to do a solo, and it takes a long time to get over that. But if you could incorporate just a bit more, a bit more kind of stock jazz phrasing into your improvisation. Maybe the best thing you could do is transcribe a solo. Transcribe some Sunny. I mean, there's not very many bebop soprano players, are there? But if you transcribed a tenor, like Sunny Stitt playing rhythm changes, you could just do it exactly the same up an octave on soprano. And you'd learn a few more little cliches that you could throw in, which will, even if you don't use those cliches, you can learn how to articulate to really make it swing. The second part of my articulation video is how to phrase jazz. So you can go and check out that. I know that Chad LB 
this year has done a video on um, jazz articulation. You can check that one out. That's quite interesting. He suggests that you tongue different on an ascending line to a descending line. I'm sure some of you have seen that video. That's pretty cool. So I'll show you what I mean. Um, I'll try and play just a few, you know, a couple of eight bars of rhythm changes with a bit more of that swing feel and the kind of cliches that I'm talking about. Put myself on the spot here as usual. Not my greatest ever rhythm changes solo, but you get the idea. It's just that swing and that phrasing and learning a few stock phrases which can really help you out there. So wonderful job, thanks very much. I'm sure we all appreciate that. Even harder when you're doing a video of yourself taking a solo, eh? Right, let's go for let's go for two more and then we've done 15 videos. That's not bad, is it? Right, we've got Neville Barter playing crazy. Here we go. Anybody is Neville in the chat? I'm not sure if I've seen him yet. Nice titles, Nev. Okay, great job, Neville. Thanks for putting that in. Does it freak anybody else out? You know, when the camera reverses the image, so it looks like his hands are the wrong way in sax. Has anybody else noticed that? <laughs> um, that was a great performance. I love the fact you really shape the melody nicely. You've got a lot of feeling in your playing. In terms of taking it to the next levels, for one thing, I think you're playing a little bit sharp throughout, especially on the higher notes. But you know what they say about alto sax, you're better to be sharp than out of tune. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I've thrown myself with my stupid musical dad joke there. Anyway, yeah. So either you want to pull your mouthpiece off a bit to bring the pitch down, but ideally, I think you're probably um, using too much up and down pressure with your embouchure. You want, instead of the sort of having a line, you want to make more of a circle with your embouchure support the armature from the side more, that will make your bottom lip more baggy, you'll have less pressure on the reed, the pitch of your sax will go down in general, and number one, you'll have a great, much better sound, and number two, you'll be playing more in tune. Another thing you could do is tune in next week and learn how to get a really nice vibrato going, but apart from that, wonderful job, thanks very much for submitting your video. Let's give it up for Nev. Yeah, somebody said in the chat, a left. Imagine if you could get a left-handed sax. That would be mental, wouldn't it? All right, last one, folks. Um, if you are really enjoying this, put a note in the um, put a note in the um, chat there, and let me know if you want me to do another one of these when I go live next month. Because I've certainly got enough videos to do so. That's for sure. It's like getting a mini free lesson, isn't it? Really. Okay, here we go. Last one of the day is Adam Sample, and he's going to play Misty for us.
Okay, that was awesome. I love that version of Misty Adam. Thanks very much. So, nice timing. You're really playing um, well with the backing track. You know, nice version there. You're sticking nice and close to the melody. Really love that. Um, so the comments I've got to go from, you know, good to great on this. Maybe have a look at how you can subtone. Now, the great thing about playing tenor is on this melody and you're playing it in the key of F for tenor. Um, you can really whiffle it up a bit in this style. By whiffle it up, I mean you're going to retract your bottom jaw, take your teeth further back to the edge of the mouthpiece, and you're going to feather that sound to get that, that kind of fluffy, rich, warm subtone sound. And combined with that, you can warm it up with some nice vibrato. Add the vibrato, add the subtone, and you're really going to, because at the moment, it's got that slightly boxy, full tone. It's, you know, more... Oh, I'm not going to open up the can of worms by saying it's more like a classical sound, so I just said it. <laughs> anyway, what we're looking for with this ballad is just that depth of sound, because why do you want to play tenor? Because you want to play ballads like this on tenor, especially if you're in a jazz style. So I'll try and demonstrate the kind of tone that you're using, and then I'll try and demonstrate the kind of tone that I'm talking about. So here we go. Uh, what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to go back to full screen again. Okay, here we go. Sorry about the click every time I change, um, turn my mic off, by the way. So hopefully you can tell the difference there between the kind of the full sound. Um, it's not really barky, but that kind of hard edged. I, I, I imagine it as a square sound moving into that more round, whiffly subtone with vibrato. You know, old school Ben Webster, Sonny Rollins, those classic tenor players. I think that's the sound you want to be looking for. Might be a mouthpiece thing as well to a certain extent. But yeah, let's have a round of applause for the last video. Yay! Now get your questions ready folks, because we are going to have a little quick Q&A before, before we wind up for the day. So anybody got any questions, stick them in the chat now and thank you from the bottom of my heart to everybody who has submitted a video. You're all heroes in my book, all absolutely awesome. Because it's not an easy thing to do to put yourself in the limelight in front of all these people and God knows how many thousands are going to watch this. Okay, let's move on to the Q&A. Okay, let's see if anybody's got any questions. We haven't got like all the time in the world left. I normally try and keep the lives to about an hour, but I'm going to have a sip while I look and see what we got. Right, let's start with uh, Princess <laughs> the Princess and Ribena. Love that. I busted my elbow. No sacks for six weeks. Oh no! Can you recommend exercises to keep good arm shirt and breathing without using the sacks? Yes, I can. So, the classic one is um, 
is one I learned from my old teacher, Jean Toussaint, um, an American who lives in the UK now, who um, played with Art Blakey, Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. He taught me this uh, embouchure calisthenics exercises, which are in my Total Tone Mastery course, incidentally, plug, plug. Now, full disclosure, you are gonna look like a complete idiot, Miss Ribena. So get used to it. What you do is, you pull your face back into a weird smile like the Joker, which is why I call it the Joker in the course. And you really strain these muscles at the side as hard as you can until they're burning for about maybe five to 10 seconds. Then you push them forward into the hardest duck bill pout that you can, that you can master for five seconds. So silliness warning, here we go. Okay, it doesn't translate very well on the YouTube format, a bit of dead air time like that. But that's the exercise you do. That will keep your chops in shape while you're recuperating from your injury. And you could even just blow your mouthpiece, start working on your mouthpiece pitch. That's a really great exercise, which is also in total tone mastery. So you blow your mouthpiece and you try and use your larynx to get up to an octave or more blowing your mouthpiece. Hope that answers your question. How do I, uh, oh, this seems to be staying on the chat forever until I take it off. Okay. Um, right, Larry, how you doing? Larry, how much grease and how often for the neck cork? I don't think you should need much neck grease, uh, neck cork grease. Um, I'm a bit, no, you are supposed to take your mouthpiece off when you play, otherwise you can compress the cork over time. The cork subtly like re-expands when you take your mouthpiece off, but most times in the heat of the moment, I will just clean my mouthpiece and neck and leave the mouthpiece on the neck, in which case you virtually never need cork grease. But I think um, I'm gonna just put a number on it. I'm gonna say a tiny bit of cork grease once every three weeks. There you go, I just made that up. <laughs> okay, um, take that off. Um, okay, a few people might be wondering where their videos are, like the Saxo boy is asking. Uh, if your video wasn't featured, it's because you weren't quick enough getting in there. There were about 50 videos or something submitted and then you got through the first 15. So it was first come, first served, I'm afraid. Also, um, the only videos I, I only told people on my mailing list about the videos. So if you wanna get informed about these things in the future and you're not, on my mailing list, the easiest thing you can do, as it happens, is go and watch the masterclass, because in the process of signing up for the masterclass, you'll then be on my email list and you'll hear about all these cool things about the lives, etc. cetera. So um, yeah, sorry about that, Saxo boy. I know, a bit of a disappointment, many apologies. Uh, okay, here we go. This is quite an interesting little question. Do you think you can be self-taught? Well. The answer to that is definitely yes, because there are many fantastic self-taught saxophonists. Will you end up a little bit lip bendy and um, idiosyncratic and possibly have intonation issues? Well, the evidence seems to support that you will, but that doesn't make you any less individual. And actually the pitfall of being taught by someone else or by a set method is that it just churns out people who sound exactly the same. So I love the kind of vibe of people who are self-taught, but sometimes it can also be a little bit wild for certain situations. But yeah, you can be self -taught. I mean, what's everyone doing watching this, for example? <laughs> okay, a quick question from Rob, who you now know because he's a superstar from his submission. Do you regularly use the Read Geek uh, to keep your reads sounding good or a Read Geek substitute? I normally, you know, flatten out the back and I'll certainly use it for a bit to try and get dodgy reads working. I must admit, I'm starting to use Legere reads a little bit more. Mm, sometimes because I like them, sometimes for convenience. I'm playing a Legere on both horns today as it happens, just because they don't dry out in the middle of the session and all that stuff. And uh, I find it quite convenient. But yeah, I do regularly use a read gig, but I'm not really mad on it. You know, I don't go over the top with all that stuff. Any other questions? Okay, bear with me while I look through here. 
Yeah, now this is quite a relevant question from Ben D. I understand you're in the process of coming up with a new course. Yes, I am. In fact, right before the show, I was looking through all your questionnaire answers about your number one problem that isn't related to tone because I've covered that in Total Tone Mastery. So looking forward to that. Could you teach us how to really articulate on the sax uh, like the pros, like how the pros do so, love that. Um, that's a great point. It is one of the really stronger categories for the things that people are asking to learn. Whoops, oh man, I just stood on my mic. <laughs> Hopefully everyone can still hear me. I might do a course about phrasing and articulation and playing in different styles and um, breathing. And I might do a course on the whole thing. The strongest contender at the moment, although I haven't finished doing research, is a course about improvising. But yeah, it's a really good call. And if I don't do a whole course on it, I'll definitely focus some videos on it. So thanks for that great comment. <laughs> uh, right, let's have a little look. Incidentally, which side is it? That side. Um, if you're enjoying the content, you can go to www.buymeacoffee.com forward slash get your sacks together and you can get us a coffee if you want to say thank you. There's absolutely no need to. I'm happy to provide it all for free. But if you want to do that, then that's the way to, you know, show a bit of show a bit of love to the channel. David is asking how many submissions I got. I think it was up to 50 last time I looked. Uh, quick question from John. Do you recommend a warm down after practice session? I never warm down. Should I? I don't know. I've never warmed down. It, trumpet players do, don't they? Because they have to like reset the lips and all that, but I've never found it necessary. Okay, Pugwash. To get the growl into a sound, should I use my throat or my tongue? You use your throat. You can hum, hum into the sax as you're playing the note. Um, I'm sure many of you know how to growl. So you go. The other way of growling is to use your tongue. You put your tongue in the top of your mouth and you you, you kind of buzz your tongue. That's the second method of growling. Um, but you can't tongue at the same time as you do that and it's a more dramatic growl that sounds like this. So you can do both. I would probably go with the humming thing unless you want the really dramatic effect. Thanks for your question. Um, let's try this one from Robert. Do you clean your mouth? Do you clean your mouthpiece and read? Have a composite read and the whole. <laughs> oh yeah, every time I play, definitely clean the whole mouthpiece, neck, read, pull through your sacks. That's very important. So definitely do that. I wipe off the read to make sure it's all clean. Yeah, it's going to just get mank otherwise, isn't it? Right, a couple more questions. Um, Right, quick one here. Is it just personal preference whether the ligature screw is on top of the mouthpiece or under? Um, sometimes the ligature manufacturer will dictate. For example, I have a uh, pretty standard Van Doren MO ligature. See if it will focus on me instead of my face. And if I turn it, look, you can see it's got these ridges. So that's obvious. You can't have that mouthpiece the other way. Some of them. Um, and actually the same on my tenor. I've got a Rovner. Oh, I, can't remember, I can't remember the name of the Rovner. Rovner Versa. If I hold that up there. Right, come on. You can see that because of the design of the ligature. Uh, well, maybe if I do it that way, look. You see those metal things on the ligature. You can only have that ligature one way. But some ligatures you could have underneath. I would tend to go with the band that goes over the reed rather than the buckle that goes over the reed because then you're only holding the reed kind of with half the amount. Oh, there's a lot of big deals about ligatures. It doesn't matter too much at the end of the day, as long as it holds the reed, the reed nice and firm. Scanning through then, how far are we from the bottom? Right, I'll take, let's do three more questions and then wind it up. So apologies if I haven't answered your question. <laughs> Um, uh, I'll try and answer this from Zoltan. How to keep subtones even and consistent without accidentally jumping into the normal tone. Is it the airflow you play with? No, you tend to play with the 
position of your jaw, bottom jaw horizontally, and your top teeth. So for subtone, you move your top teeth to the edge of the mouthpiece. For subtone, you move your teeth right to the edge of the mouthpiece there. And you bring your bottom jaw back. In fact, your bottom teeth would be like hanging off the end of the mouthpiece, probably. So that's what you play with. And that means that will kind of restrict you from popping into full tone. All right. Uh, two more questions again. Sorry, I, I would love to sit here for another hour and answer everyone's questions. Believe me, I love it. But I've actually got a lesson. I mean, I've got somebody coming for a lesson. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Look at this, this isn't a question, but I have a great teacher, his name is Jamie. Another sax player called Jamie, who knew? <laughs> right, two more questions. Let's go with Pugwash. Quick question, to get the Junior Walker style growl into a sound, should I use my throat or tongue? He often uses that, uh, the tongue, I think he does both, but when he, you know, he does those real, um, like at the start of shotgun and stuff like that, that's tongue you know, tongue rips, tongue rips. Um, but yeah, using, doing that with your tongue. I'm just having a bit of a brain freeze. Um, okay, Saxo Boy is asking, power ring versus which one is better? I haven't tried a power ring. I would like to use a power ring. I've got a Jody Jazz mouthpiece. Um, I'll tell you what I have. I know that many players prefer the power ring. Um, Ooh. Okay, last one then, here we go. This is from our celebrity from earlier, Paul Bonnet. So at least I can do is answer his question. What gap should I have between the reed tip and the mouthpiece? So in other words, um, what he's referring to is if the camera will behave itself, get rid of my eyes, right. He's referring to this gap here, which is between the tip of the reed and the mouthpiece. That is, of course, called your tip opening. So when you buy a mouthpiece, I know many of you know this already, but I'll just recap it because it's quite important for beginners or whatever. When you buy a mouthpiece, it'll have a number, usually a number, typically from about four to maybe nine maximum. That is the gap that, um, between the reed and the mouthpiece is how much scoop you know, it's how much scoop they cut into the mouthpiece. If there's a big gap between the tip of your reed and your mouthpiece, it's harder to get that reed to vibrate. But when the reed does vibrate, it moves further. So you can get a bigger sound by having a wider tip opening mouthpiece, but it is harder to control and it's harder to get that going. So the wider the tip opening, you tend to have a softer reed. My tip, my tip opening is eight. I think my tenor mouthpieces even might be nine or something and I've got about a three and a half read which isn't ridiculous but it's kind of hard ish because I blow like a ridiculous amount of force into the sax. If you're a beginner you probably start with you know a Yamaha 4C or something like that intermediate you might be okay with like a uh, five six seven and if you want to get that really massive kind of barn door sound um, you want to go for like eight possibly nine even. Hope that helps. Right, how do I, um, I've never quite figured out why these comments are staying on there, but that's all cool. Right, thank you very much for joining me today, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed the new format. Many apologies if your video wasn't submitted. I hate to be a heartbreaker. If I could just be here all day, I would watch these videos all day. <laughs> I'm sure you'd enjoy it as well. Um, but thank you if you submitted a video. I have got them all on file, so if we all decide if you decide that you like this format, there's plenty more videos there. And, you know, feel free to submit your video because who knows what's going to happen at a later date. We might just do loads of them, in which case you'll move up the queue. Um, if you haven't already watched it, I really do urge you to go and uh, fill in your email. It's just all you have to do is fill in your email. If you're the first time viewer, if you're a first time going on my site, you'll get an email saying, is this definitely your email? Just to confirm emails. And then you'll be taken straight to the course and you can watch the free Saxophone Success Masterclass, which is an hour of solid saxophone goodness. You're going to dig it, I promise. Even if you watched it, go watch it again because there's always stuff you've forgotten, believe me. If you're feeling in a particularly beneficial 
frame of mind, you can stick me a little coffee by using uh, www.buymeacoffee.com forward slash get your sacks together. And for all of you who have bought me a coffee in the past, let me say just how much I appreciate it. You're all so generous. I don't have a chance to reply to all the comments on there, um, but I really do appreciate it. You're all wonderful, wonderful people. Sunday's video is gonna be on vibrato. So hope you enjoy that. And until then, oh, what's my, I can't even remember my own catchphrase now. Practice hard, practice smart, and enjoy your music. See you later, folks.